Yes, yeah, so I'm a cellist and a composer. A very, very far left field contemporary classical music. It's the kind of boom, ah. stuff. Often we work in teams, whether it's the music team or the bigger sound team or across the whole film. You know, everyone's rallying towards the same end goal. So I often work in other people's writing teams. You know, you, you get very good at delegating by just by necessity. When you watch the credits of a film and production designer comes up or set designer, you're not under the impression that they actually hand built every single set. There are a lot of people involved. And sort of delegation by specialization is, is I think, sort of the best way to go with that. And so one thing that does happen a lot, uh, from my experience, is getting a handful of people on in the writing team stage. I was not a classical composer. I came from much more of a uh, singer-songwriter background. Lots of touring and lots of um, you know, experiences on the road, meeting people. But I also worked in a band called Uncle, big collaborative project. It involved a lot of people, multimedia, but mainly going on the road and doing shows, but equally, there was quite a lot of very cinematic pieces. I got to work on a score for a film called Sexy Beast, which was sort of 15 years ago now, but it opened my eyes at a very young age to what music for film and television can be. Often it's just a more efficient use of, of resources and time to get someone else to flesh things out from you know, a piano score or a, a computer mock-up into a full-blown orchestral template. Either you specify, you choose someone who is a, like a wind and brass specialist or a string specialist or a, a this, that, or the other. There are people who focus or you know, their background is in, in one thing or another. So I don't do what the other two guys do. I do things from a much more technical standpoint. I often help out with the programming side, making the score sound bigger before the demo stage when they're laid up to picture. But most of the time I spend uh, recording and mixing music to picture. I studied music as well, which helps. You be, need to be able to have those conversations with the composers when they're, when they're conducting, which you'll see Peter do. There's a I also wanted to talk a bit about the process aside from making the music, because that process can be 90% of the project, it can be 50% of the project, but there is always a lot of politics, and what is expected of a composer is very, very hard to know. Where the power lies, where the creativity lies, what is expected of you during that journey, I think it is always different and directors are always different. Some have a good sense of what they want musically, some don't. There should always be an idea of the vision. The big complication is when you are actually expected to mock these things up, they're not measuring it against other mock-ups. They're measuring it against, well, this is the full symphony orchestra on Harry Potter, and here's your, your string quartet demo from a computer. It's like, well, this sounds quieter than that. Why does it sound quieter than that? I'm like, well, because it's got 36 people less per instrument. I guess the way the composers get involved, or when they get involved, particularly with feature films, would be at the point at which there is a rough cut. The director has delivered you a rough cut of a film or a scene, something you might have to demo. Some, sometimes you're pitching against other people. Sometimes you might know that really you've got it in the bag. When I was writing this, this film, the, I was very, very lucky to have a really, really arty director. 
And he had this brilliant phrase, which was, directors and producers will happily watch a wireframe with, um, for CGI. They don't expect to see polished visuals from day one. They understand that it's a modular process and it starts looking shit and it ends up looking brilliant. It just takes a bit of time and, you know, trust me, it'll work. But we don't seem to have that luxury. Knowing where the power lies and knowing how to navigate that path is as important, I'm afraid, as in, from my experience, as the music itself. I know some composers that are good, and I know some that are very good, and I know some that are very good at playing the game. There's a lot to be said for that. I'm actually not one of them. I bloody hate all of that. Directors generally will leave the meeting by saying, look, I don't want to tell you what to do. It's our job to bring something else to it and interpret it in our way. Freedom is so important in being able to create a piece of music. If you feel stifled, it's very, very difficult. So say we sort of come into this point of delivery, working in a team with a lot of people, uh, it's about really, really solid project management and really, really solid version control and all these sorts of sort of issues. It also comes down to you can't always wait for the moment of a divine inspiration to be sitting in a tree thinking about a B flat that might happen to work against a certain picture. And you do rely heavily on a, I certainly rely heavily on a kind of notional craft of composition, of being able to write something where something is preferable to nothing. It's just that kind of structure, the ability to make music fit. Once you've had a chance to sit down and review the rough cut or scenes or whatever you are given, it's a really good idea to then sit down with the director to just talk over all of their ideas, to get an idea of their overall vision. As I said, they don't always know what they want. There will be a sense of the mood or type of score. You need to establish that way before you're going in to kind of start creating music. I find it kind of filter out all of the interference that's going on and really hone into what you need in position to be able to complete a score of music. I started working with a lot of other composers and you end up being asked, I end up being asked to try and make sounds that either the computer couldn't do or was loath to do in a timely fashion. And so you end up sort of treating the, the cello a little bit like a synthesizer. So trying to find ways of creating new sounds or new ways of, of doing something. So in my life, I often get sent backing tracks or picture or scores. And at various stages in the production process, we'll track up cello, acoustic or electric, um, either to create a real string section or really sort of focused solo lines or just basically augmented foley. You have the producers and if you are talking too much to the producers, that can also be a very tricky thing because let's not forget, although producers claim that they can be creative and blah, 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 they are all about the money and how they're going to make that. When a director and a producer are clashing, which they can do, it can be a very difficult place to be as a composer. You kind of want the director to sort of shield you away from that in a, to a respect, because I think, it, again, if you're dealing too much with the producer coming forward with ideas, you're probably on a ship that's going like this in the water. about later on in the recording process is whether to go free form freestyle against picture just sitting playing or whether you work to a grid talking about a grid we talk about like pro tools logic so hitting very very strong picture cuts um, may, means we can do this and have it beautifully beautifully in sync a couple of ways to do that one is to get a free form performance and edit it in place or you could conduct a picture, or the speediest, quickest, happiest, cheapest way to do it is to spend that bit of time and, and write it into a very structured uh, kind of Pro Tools session, Logic, Cubase, whatever it might be. Basically, when I get the call, we'd usually talk about what the project is. It could be a TV show, or it could be a film, and you kind of have to discuss what there is to do. There's two stages, really. There's the record and the mix, but you get record stems, and you'll have 
the demo of everything you'll be tracking. So if you're doing strings, then you'll have the demo strings, and you, so you can mute it basically on this like this lovely big desk, and also so the string players don't hear the fake strings in their headphones when they're recording. Yeah, so you might have like demo strings, demo brass, demo harp, demo piano, whatever, all as separates, and then you have the rest of the music as the backing track, so you can record onto that. You, uh, you can understand how it's going to work against that um, with the picture. And so a lot of time is spent, especially if you've got a lot of, you know, there's a lot of cues in some of these things. There's up to like 50 starts sometimes. So you have to build sessions for all of those, and then you have to take them to the studio. Now, depending on which studio you go to, so if you're going to somewhere big like Abbey Road, you don't really have to worry about it because they're being paid a lot of money to, um, to look after that side of it. In a smaller studio, like the assistants are usually very good, but sometimes they might not have that much experience with that as compared to, you know, big Hollywood sessions at Abbey Road or Air. So yeah, you speak to them ahead of time, you tell them what mics, which is what we actually did here, and like what mics you want, where you would like them, where they would like to come up the desk, what, how many headphones feeds you need, all the rest of that. So this is all before you've recorded a single note of music. So there's quite a lot of preparation, I think is the point to take away from this section. So you kind of have to look, take this your responsibility as the engineer to make sure that's okay. So you normally work with an engineer to place microphones uh, for an orchestra in a, an unusual room like this. Um, something like this, which is a copy of a, an AKG 414 made by um, studio and trying to condense a microphone and it would be used for um, percussion it's really good for close micing these sorts of things we've got a neumann 87 these are cellists favorite friends as a cellist this is my best friend um, they're fantastic for getting the, the, the dynamics and the kind of warm lush low end of a cello um, and they, they're very, very good and directional. Not going to get too much noise from everywhere else. So these are also made by AKG. This is a 451. Uh, these are pencil, these are dynamic microphones. This is a pointy one. Um, goes above dynamic, sort of brighter instruments. So these are here over the violas. Uh, you wouldn't use the same microphones for a cello as you would a viola, um, not just because of the size of the instrument, but where you play it. So viola's sound goes up, so it makes logical sense. If you imagine this is like your ear, the best sound is had up high, whereas with a cello, it's found down low. And the same goes with the, uh, the violins. As Joe said, we've got these um, outrigged microphones picking up roughly the sound heard behind the conductor's head, so you want to hear it you want to capture that sound. If you're balancing the room, you would uh, assume that that would be where your kind of primary sound is to be found. And over here on the piano, these are also some 414s, or similar. Yeah, these are actually 414s. Um, these are fantastic. These are like the kind of go-to mics for putting in front of anything that's going to just need that sort of uh, super dependable, it's got various different polar patterns. So if you look front here, you can choose different polar patterns of it. You've got a lot of control, whether it's um, omni or whether it's uh, direction, whatever. So you put them inside the piano. Um, if you were doing a more kind of luxurious piano recording, you would go to town with like, mics further away and some closer in. The, these little pencil Neumanns as well, above the violins, really are nice and crispy and actually they work very well on cellos as well uh, for capturing the high end and the, the kind of top shiny stuff of a cello finger noise and bow noise that really adds personality to it uh, but it's normally it's traditionally better kept for, for like a violin sound.
be approved, you want the people to like it, so you write something that sounds good. And that doesn't often translate into what will be playable. I feel like there's a kind of a, a point that we've reached at the moment where samples are so good, but they do encourage a very different style of writing. And I think the one thing that I really appreciate with my sort of very classical background um, is that you don't ever lose this kind of pedantry, you know, so how you make a three-beat note, what it looks like in a 4-4 bar is, it actually isn't quite as simple as, as the computer will make you think. It may not actually sound so good. The samples may not sound as good, but if it's orchestrated correctly, it'll sound a million dollars when the orchestra play it, if you're fortunate enough to have a real orchestra that you know are going to be playing it. I always think it's better to have something playing on top that's live. I think a layman can tell, like, that nothing is there live and it just doesn't feel as exciting or as energetic. Everybody's starting to sound the same because these tools are uh, becoming more and more, uh, yeah, more and more widespread and affordable. Like before, you know, 10 years ago, you used to have the big Giga Studio rack with like, you know, it costs you £100,000 just to get started in making your orchestral mock-ups. Now you can do it like, I mean, Spitfire's thing is like a £400 entry thing, and it's nuts, it, and it sounds amazing. But then what I'm finding is that more and more people are wanting to get away from that sound because it's so, it's so, it's everywhere now, like everybody can sound the same. So it seems like people are rebutting against that, trying to get a bit more, bit more weird and processed and, and a bit more unique, which I'm all in favour of. I am Adam. I'm a sound designer and composer by trade. What we're going to cover today the stems from uh, Morley College, looking at how, what production techniques we can use to kind of make it sound a bit fuller, a bit richer um, for sound to, uh, sound to picture. What we got was a bunch of, uh, a score by Joel Cabri, and we had, you know, a couple of violin players, viola, piano, and cello. So these, these have been uh, rejuvenated, as it were, with a, with a bit more strings just to kind of give a bit more width to everything. There was actually originally a double bass part that was meant to happen. It wasn't recorded on the day. I was given the score and I just kind of played it in myself, which adds this really necessary low end to the entire piece, which kind of gives it this gravity, which is, I think, really you know, evocative in terms of the piece, because it's, it's an incredibly violent piece uh, scene that we just watched. So, you know, if I just solo this. without and then I bring it in. It makes a real difference to everything and it kind of gives it this enormous, you know, it's like adding, you know, a sub to everything. And then I doubled it with a, with a cello. It's just kind of gave it that more, that much like richer sound. So, I'll, you know, without the cello it sounds... Still, still a really lush piece, but it just kind of gives it, like, it kind of tricks you into thinking that we had like a full orchestra going on there. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's working with normal strings. I, I would say it's not, it's, in an ideal situation, it'd be great to always have a, an orchestral uh, ensemble at hand that you can just record at any time. Not gonna happen really, in realistic terms. So working with real strings and combining uh, libraries is, you know, the, the, the optimum um, that you can really get without obviously being Hans Zimmer um, and just having an orchestra whenever you want them. Because we get stuck, you know, talking about temp tracks, talking about demos and, and all these things. The big issue with a temp score is it's like fully polished music. It's completed, it's beautiful, it's lush, it's been recorded. Even if it's with fake instruments, it's been produced. So it's the kind of polished real deal. We come along with our shitty little kind of 
scratchy laptop sounds, and it's always going to sound worse. The old stuff that is often discarded because it's 250 years old is 250 years old for a very good reason. My one thing is, is really don't forget about the fundamentals and the basics because they really, really add up. Use a, you know, a DAW as a tape recorder and nothing more for the beginning of the process because I think if you're constantly looking for this to, to do things for you, you're relying less on what you're emotionally trying to achieve. Ultimately, I think we're dealing with an emotional response. If you don't feel that emotional response, then how are you going to be able to share that with other people? So I think that's the ultimate. Forget everything else, you know. It's about having faith in your own ability, and it's about your emotional response to something, whether it be film or, you know, TV or anything, an abstract art piece. Ask players for their advice. Everyone likes to be asked for their opinion. Um, everyone likes to go off on one talking about why they can't do this or what they could do better. And that's, that's where you'll find your kind of little treasure trove of people, uh, is asking people for their advice. Enjoy the process, navigate the politics, have the freedom to explore your ideas, play to your strengths, challenge yourself, have faith in your ability, and emotionally engage, and you'll be fine. Thanks a lot. <laughs>